All right, everyone. So for today, uh, the this week of the of the course, uh, we we've really focused a lot on uh, setting up this foundation so that we can start to make uh, our app. And the big idea very recently was that we finally imported our project, and now it's a it's an app. So that was very exciting. And um, in short, basically any HTML project that you create and put it into the um, into that framework will um, will become a brand new um, app. So the challenge is to create something visually interesting and useful, and that's why we're using jQuery Mobile. jQuery Mobile is not the only way to make the interface. jQuery Mobile is the one we're using here. Other ones that you might have heard of. There's another one called Ionic. Ionic is a popular way to design also an interface for a mobile device. Um, Ionic, I believe now, is actually the uh, official design interface for Kodika. Um, going forward, they're using, I believe now, Ionic rather than jQuery mobile. And another one that's also famous uh, is called Sencha. Uh, you might also know it as Sencha Touch. What's that? Uh, S-E-N-C-H-A. Sencha. That those three and other ones are the point of those are to make an interface for our apps. And so once we've got that interface, we can make it do cool stuff with all of those plugins we talked about previously. Question? Yeah, um, I hear about it in Android Yeah, the thing about Android Studio, that's the official way to make an Android app, but it limits you to only making an Android app. You can't use Android Studio to make an iPhone app and such. That's why we're we're skipping it. Taco is more universal. Even Visual Studio nowadays, Visual Studio that's been around for years and years to make Windows apps, Visual Studio saw the writing on the wall, and now if you get Visual Studio, you can make an iPhone app, an Android app, a Windows app out of Visual Studio. It's basically what we're doing in Taco, but with less overhead. You do Taco Build, and there it is. Over on Visual Studio, you have to load a brand new solution, refactor it, blah, 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 all of that stuff. And you have to do download like 23 gigabytes of content if you're going to use Visual Studio. In Taco, it's only like one or two gigabytes. The Ionic website, Ionic I.O. I.O.N. It's a framework. Ionic. It's a framework. Yeah, it's frame a framework to make websites, web apps, which then with Taco, we make them full apps. So which one? Both? Wh which are the options? Uh, Ionicframework.com or Ionic.io. Hmm, not exactly sure. I haven't looked into it far enough, but I think it's ionic.io. It's the one that I hear. So what we're going to do today is we're going to add more functionality to our project. Last time we played with a bunch of plugins, and they were basically proof of concepts to show you. We write a little JavaScript, and now our web app can do many more things. The most impressive, of course, was to take a photo. Our particular app eventually won't really use that functionality, but we know how to use it, so then we can apply it to an app where we do want to take photos. We want to deal with databases and all of that, and we're getting close to that. But what I want to talk about today is more JavaScript regarding uh, customization of the app. I want to be able to have the user you know, sort of sign in to the app, so the app will accept the user's name, and then customize the app with their name. The challenge is that the traditional way to do this that would be transitory data. It would be data that once you say, I log in as John, that would disappear. As soon as you shut down the app and restart it, all that customization goes away. Because of the basic nature of JavaScript, <coughs> variables and such are temporary. Once you close the web browser, or in our case, once you close the app, it forgets all of our variables. It forgets everything that we've stored. So we're going to deal with an HTML5 construct known as local storage, which is a way to create, in a sense, permanent variables. If this, doesn't, if this doesn't quite make sense at the moment, it will. But what you want to do at this point is you should have a copy of my work from last time on your flash drive, or if you're using your own work, great. I've got mine that I'm going to work on with today's date. And you want to open Node at that point. So remember, Shift, right click your folder and open with command window and the question was what's the difference between node command prompt and this command window nothing really just a little bit of the branding that at the top 
Remember, if you go directly to Node, it says Node.js command prompt. And here is the plain old command prompt. So not really a big difference. It's just easier to do it this way because shift right click and you're in the folder instead of CD backspace and CD slash and CD that to get into the folder. So you should be inside your project folder. Is your file 15 camp or 17 camp? I'm doing 17. No, that's right. I copied 15 from drive Z to my flash drive and named it to 17. Okay. So 15. Mm -hmm. The last one. Sorry, if I, if I said 10, sorry, I meant 15. The last one from the last day. So you just want to have your command window open for the moment. And over here on the Windows Explorer, um, I'm going to open the project folder in the Windows Explorer. And then your WW folder. So our project in its totality, the web aspect of it is here. And all the other folders have the code for Android or, or browser or iOS, whatever. And so we've, uh, we've got index. Eventually, we need to work on map. Remember, we've kind of left that thread hanging where that map file has not been upgraded with the code that we put over on index. We haven't put the Cordova JS file. We haven't put um, other metadata there. We'll get to it later. But uh, we've got index, JavaScript, and CSS to work with. Let's open up the JavaScript, well, both the JavaScript and the index HTML. Let's open both of those in Notepad. So you can select them both, right click, edit with Notepad. Question? Backing up just a little bit, do you know how similar the Ionic script is to, uh, to what we're working with now? Is it, is it the same basic syntax or is it different? It's, it's different. Um, whereas we use data rollover and over because that's a jQuery mobile <laughs> construct. Ionic uses something else. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember what it is, but it's probably something like IO dash something. They've all got their own sort of like proprietary code for you to use for you to do something quickly. Because when we have data roll nav bar, what that does, what jQuery Mobile does, is then just quickly creates a nav bar instead of us manually coding it ourselves. Ionic does something similar. Sencha does something similar. The other one, um, what's the other big one? React JS and those. Those create Angular JS. Those create allow us to do something quickly instead of manually piece by piece writing the JavaScript and CSS and HTML. Are they, are they all based on the XML server that was the ActionScript is based on? They were, they're not. Not really, because those are a bit more leaning towards CSS. Uh, so they wouldn't be leaning on that standard, but they have elements of JavaScript built in too. So we can always go to the website and read the documentation, and it'll tell us exactly. But they're all uh, different ways to do something quickly via, you know, CSS and such. So in our code here, let's see, index file, JavaScript file. Um, what I want to do is. At the moment, <coughs> we have a pop-up box appearing that is sort of uh, annoying. We just wanted this to make to understand how it works. Navigator notification prompt. So at about line 39, we've got a chunk of code here that run, runs without any prompting. It just runs. It's not triggered by anything. Uh, I might want to use that code later on but I don't want it active at the moment. That means I want to comment it out. So let's go to line 39 and at the beginning of line 39 add slash asterisk and then at the end of line 45 add asterisk slash. I want to comment out this chunk of code. This is the code that pops up to, that asks you for please enter your name. Um, I don't want to do it that way, and right now it just pops up without any prompting. I don't want that either. So I want to comment that line out. Um, technically, it's one line, even though it's broken into different, you know, 
lines. It's one command but broken into different lines. And so what I want to do is uh, just comment that out because I, I don't want it to keep popping up as soon as I start my app. This says enter your name. I want to do that elsewhere. So uh, just save that JavaScript for the moment. Let's jump back over to the HTML file. In the HTML file, we'll go to line 59. We've got here some buttons, um, proof of concept buttons. We press the beep button, it beeps. We press the camera button, it launches the camera. That stuff there is also just sort of there for for fun, just to see that this works. So what I want to do first is I want to move line 59. I want to move that button that opens YouTube. Again, that was just there to show that we can create external links. I want to move that line right above line 61. I want to make a new line above this little group of buttons here. And I want to move that button down there. I'm just getting it out of that UI block A. So uh, I believe I've mentioned it before, but did, do you remember that if you select your code, you can drag and drop? You don't have to cut and paste. You can drag and drop. You have to select the code in Notepad, plus plus, and then you can simply click and drag it. So just move that down there, click and drag cut and paste, whatever. What I'm saying is you want to move that other button, the YouTube button, move it down above the button for beep. So you need a new line there. And then an empty line on UI block A. To this chunk of code, I want to deactivate that as well. I may want to use it in the future. I don't want to get rid of that code. I just want to deactivate it. We commented out a little bit of JavaScript in the JavaScript file, but in the HTML file, we have to remember we have a different commenting tag. Go back to line 61 where your YouTube button starts and we'll do angle, uh, angle bracket exclamation dash dash and then its pair at the end of line 64 is dash dash angle bracket. So make sure it turns green, make sure you've commented out angle bracket exclamation dash dash the end of that chunk, dash, dash, and go back. Comment out those, those buttons and the image placeholder. We don't need them at the moment. So obviously make sure you've commented out only what you need to comment. Don't accidentally comment out that div. Things will break. Don't comment out that one. Things will break. And also over on your JS file, make sure you've only commented out lines 39 to 45. Again, don't forget that closing parenthesis from the prompt method asterisk slash there, slash asterisk. So lines 39 to 45 in the JS file, and in the HTML file, lines 61 to 64. Okay, so my idea is that in my app, it loads up, and then I've got the info, the info button that pops up to show the little bit of info about the college, and then I've also got their driving directions. I want to add an extra button there to customize the app. I want an actual trigger so that the app asks the user to provide their name. Then when it captures their name, it's going to display their name on screen in various ways. So we need to go find the spot where that about screen is at. This about screen most likely is a section. 
So let's dig back to the HTML stuff. Remember, each screen full of content usually is a section. So it's probably way at the bottom somewhere. At about line 246, we can also search if we remember what we're searching for. So let's go down to line 246. About section. That's the about screen. So looks like we left. Oh, that's that image that we had a while ago. Then there's the logo, there's the text that we wrote, there's a link to the map, article ends, end of the about section. Okay, I want to add a new button on line 257. So give yourself a brand new line 257. We will call this customize. This is going to be a button. So it's a link. I'm going to wrap the A tag around that. Let's wrap the A tag. We're, we see yeah, where... shortcut for wrapping the uh, No, not the way I did it, because I wrote the text first, and then I had to write the left and the right. But um, the shortcut would be that if you start writing the first tag, it'll close the second tag, but then you still have to write customize. And so we're, we see that we're headed toward uh, making this a button, so we will add href equals, and um, for the moment we'll do the href as a pound sign. It's not going anywhere, but I want it to act like a link. I want it to act like a button, so here's our jQuery mobile data role button. And I want an icon here, data-icon. And we've got an icon called user. This will put like a little generic person icon on the button. So we haven't had to create very much in the HTML file in a little while. So we've created a button here. And now this is where we have various options. It's a good idea to you know, test your code that you're on the right track and such, but the problem is that we don't have a basic website anymore. We have an app. So I'm not saying at the moment don't, don't actually run it in Taco yet, but what I'm saying is we have various ways to test this. Um, we can get a just a quick and dirty check if it's working. If we go to, back to the classic run Firefox, don't do Chrome because if you do Chrome, it's not, it's not going to load properly because it's going to get confused. If you do a quick and dirty run, launch Firefox, nothing else will really work very well because it's not really a web site anymore, it's an app. I just want to see, okay, all I'm looking for is that nothing looks broken, and that if I click on the About link, that it um, pops up like it's supposed to, and that I see a customized button. It doesn't do anything yet, of course, but if I don't see that, that's where I want to stop and make sure my code is right. This is not a full-fledged app anymore, I mean yet, because it's it's a web, it's a web. We're looking at it as a website. If we still had the camera button, it would not work, because it's not a web site anymore. So that was just checking that our button worked. Did the button work for? Did the button appear for everyone? Not work yet, but did it appear for people? Yes. Okay. Uh, so you see that was a quick shortcut. Usually we don't have a lot of chance to go back and test it as a plain old browser because it is different to go to Taco and do Taco Run Browser. Don't do this, but that is different because that will then make the website behave like an app. Simply doing Run Firefox makes it behave like a website. It won't work with any other stuff like camera and vibration and such. Okay, so the point of this is that I'm going to click that button and it's going to give us a pop-up to ask the user, type in your name. So in order for us to target this via JavaScript, we should be seeing that there's a syntax about this. We need either a class or an ID. We need to attach an ID or a class to this button so that via JavaScript, it knows that when we click the button, run this JavaScript. Uh, we'll do it as an ID at this point. So go back to your A tag, the start of your A tag, right there on line 257. Add a space. Inside the A tag, we'll add another attribute. 
this one is the ID attribute, and we'll call this btn um, yeah, btn name. This is a button that will ask for the user's name. So once any element is named with an ID or a class, we can access it. We can even access elements that are not named, although that's more cumbersome, because there might be more than one thing in your app that is a button. So here we're giving this a unique name that only one thing in our project has that name. Therefore, the JavaScript should find this object and let us use it faster. That's all we need for this so far. Go ahead and save the HTML file. Now we'll jump over to the JavaScript file. JavaScript. Now I haven't mentioned it in the class yet, uh, so I'll take a moment to do that. Right after this comment at the top, the very first thing that we see is this structure that says function. And notice that if you look carefully, it says function, open, close, parentheses, open, curly brace. If it's got an open curly brace, where is its closed curly brace? All the way at the bottom, last line. Close curly brace, right there. And there's also a parenthesis that's closing here. There's a parenthesis that's opening right there. And technically, there's an open parenthesis, and then a closed parenthesis, and then another open and closed one, and then semicolon. That structure right there, let me, don't do this, but if I just break it together like this, this right here was our starting point of our JavaScript. And then inside of that, inside of these curly braces, it's everything else that we're doing. This is an immediately invoked function expression, um, simply meaning um, this is JavaScript what follows. We are combining it all into one function, and there are technical details why to do this, but you often see this in modern code. Uh, so the short answer of why we're doing this is, well, that's just the way it is. And then that's, that might not be the best answer sometimes because it is a very technical answer about scope and all of that stuff. So don't really worry about it because it works. And this is the basic structure that we got right out of Taco. You get this out of Taco. You get this out of Cordova, out of PhoneGap. You get this out of Visual Studio. Over and over, you're seeing this kind of structure now with modern JavaScript because we can get very complex. So we're saying we're starting some JavaScript code inside of this function, and then it ends at the bottom. And then we've got this, use strict. That is some, something you sometimes see, but I think more and more often. And because we can run JavaScript, to some degree, JavaScript is a bit of a loosey-goosey language. In other languages, you have, to do, uh, you have to do typecasting, in that when you create variables, you say this variable is created and can only hold this type of object, only numbers. So if you try to put a word into this variable that was defined as only using numbers, you'll get an error. JavaScript is more loosey-goosey. You can also, uh, sometimes it's called duck typing. Basically, if it quacks like a duck and <laughs> flaps like a duck, it's a duck. What that means is that our JavaScript code, like our variables and such, could be, could mutate to different things. It can hold a number now, and then later have it hold a word, and later on have it hold an integer or a floating point. It can change. The thing in the variable can change. In one sense, that's very good because I don't have to deal with some of the extra typing and such of other languages. But it could be bad because you're trying to put the wrong object into another kind of object. <coughs> with use strict, this is telling the web browser or the compiler basically be a little bit more strict. Um, some of the more looser aspects of JavaScript are reined in by using that. You could get more error messages using use strict because it's going to be more strict. We haven't really gotten any big error messages yet because we're also trying. To, I'm also trying to show it to you the most correct, direct way. But if you ever wonder why does that say use strict, and if you see tutorials and such that say use strict, well, they're using strict mode, JavaScript strict mode, which is more, more strict. You could get more errors, but it could help you write perhaps more, more better code. 
that's the first things we see, and then we've got event listener, of course, device ready, and everything we've, we've seen before. So what I want to do then is write... Uh, yes? It doesn't allow deprecation either. So it's trying to be the most modern version and the most strict version, the most correct version of things, and not really hold back, you know, bad. Hold us back with bad stuff, old stuff. Okay, so what I want to do is I've got a button in the index file, but now I want to actually make it do something. So um, let's say in our code, let's uh, make sure we're inside the on device ready function, and I guess uh, let's add it. Let's go to line 62. Give yourself a brand new line 62. We're still in on device ready. And we want to create that jQuery syntax to make that button active. We've done that a couple of times already. Witness line 46 and 22 and 17. We're going to do something very similar to that again. So on line 62, dollar symbol, open close parentheses, dot on, open close parentheses, semicolon. That's our basic syntax for let's make a button active. Let's wait for a button to be clicked. Let's wait for something to be clicked and then do something about it. The something to be clicked is inside the first parentheses inside the jQuery selector. In quotes, pound btn name. That's the ID that we wrote on the button. Don't forget the pound sign there. Because we can use this to select a specific ID object. We can use this to select multiple uh, class objects. We can use it to even select plain old HTML tags. Wherever there is a P tag, for example, we could use this to select all P tags in our code and do something with all of them at once. This is jQuery. It allows us to do, what is it? Write less, do more. On parentheses click. When there's a click of that button, comma, space, function, open, close parentheses, open, close, curly brace. And I'm going to say when someone clicks on that button, we will run the function get name. We'll actually try to get the name and do other things with it. We need to define get name. It's not a reserved JavaScript command, so that means we need to create the function on the next line. So next line function, open close parentheses, no, sorry, function. Then uh, get name, open close parentheses there, curly brace, close curly brace. So now we're defining what get name actually does. Just to see if we're on the right track, because things could go wrong already at this point, we will do console.log quotes clicked. I'm just going to get some feedback. I'm going to try to click on the button and see if I get any feedback that says clicked. If that's working so far, I'm on track. If it's broken at this point so far, we need to figure out what went wrong, of course. Probably misspelling something. BTN name, forgetting the, cur uh, forgetting the, print, the, the hash mark, etc. I want to test this now. Um, I don't think it'll work with a simple, well, I'll check. I don't think it'll work with a simple run Firefox because now we're dealing with code inside of OnDeviceReady, but there's no such thing as OnDeviceReady. Let me just confirm this. Yeah. So we're not going to, for this, we're not going to be able to see our result with simply run Firefox. For this, we do have to either run Android emulate Android, or maybe faster than all of them, run browser. Make sure your JS and your HTML files are saved. Let's go back to Taco. Back to Node. Command prompt. Taco run browser. Let 
let's run this in the browser there's that JavaScript code so far let's run this in the browser and let's see if it works remember we're doing console log output you don't see the console directly on screen where do you see the console F12 once you load that up in the browser in Chrome F12 to see your console and then click that button a couple of times and you should see in the console it should say clicked So my project loaded up here, uh, it might say allow or block, just whatever, allow it for the moment. Um, press F12 and then on your screen on the side switch to your console view. Do you see any scary warnings? We've talked about those before, don't worry about those. But I want to go to the info button. I want to click customize and look at my console output right there, clicked, and every time I click it, I've clicked it twice, three times, whatever. So I should see that that button. I should see that that button is now active, basically. And there's my code so far. Anyone need any help? You should see that the button is clickable, and you should get console output. All right, so everyone's good. We're ready to go. Okay, so this button works, and the point of this button is that a pop-up will happen, and it will ask for the user's name. So next line after line 64, let's type prompt. Prompt will uh, be, create a basic prompt on screen that will ask a user something. What we will ask them in the parentheses, in quotes, we will ask, um, what's your name? Let's make it like some of these more modern websites and apps and such that are more personal, rather than please enter user name. We ask, what's your name? So this will make a pop-up that will ask, what's your name? Save it and run it in the browser to see the result. Remember, once you've uh, run the browser once, it's going to be kind of stuck in this right here. So you have to control C twice. I guess that might be faster. Oh, you can do that faster. Control C twice instead of having to answer yes. So if you control C twice, it'll terminate that, and it'll let you back up to toggle run again. Remember, just press up on the keyboard to bring back the last command. So prompt is a plain old JavaScript method. Technically, I believe it should be navigator.prompt or maybe window.prompt. Um, there's an object, navigator or window, one of those, and then there's the method prompt. So we're running the prompt method, which should just give us a pop-up that asks, what's your name? So I'll go back to the info screen, I'll click on customize, pop-up, what's your name? John Smith. Click OK. And that's all that does for the moment. It doesn't do anything else, really. But we've got a pop-up happening. And this is what I said earlier about the impermanence of data. This asked for your name, and then it didn't do anything else with it. It just went away to the big bit bucket in the sky, just went away. 
nothing was done with it. We want to save it. Uh, we want to we want to save it. We want to work with it on a more permanent basis. So we can create a variable. A variable is a container. We've talked about those a little before. This container right here, this plastic bottle, can hold water or apple juice or gin or anything, and um, it will it will let me hold anything. So we're we're going to create a variable first. Let me back up here, back to the beginning of line 65. I'll type var space. This will create a variable, and we will call this variable um, username. Username is good. Equals space. Should it be VPROM? No, sorry, I missed a, a number right there. Um, VAR space username equals prompt. Create a variable called username. And because it's two words, I'm using enter caps, camel caps, so that it really needs a second word. You don't want to use spaces there because then that actually would create problems. Uh, you can use underscores and such, but we'll keep it like this, one word. And notice then I put equals prompt. We've talked about this, that once we create a variable, let's say we wrote var username semicolon at the end. Then on the next line, we could write username equals John. So the equals is basically take the thing on the right and put it into the thing on the left. And here it's more complex. We're not we're not putting an actual name that we hard code. We're asking the person, "What's your name?" That name will then be put into the username. Next line to see if that's working. Console dot log username, not in quotes. Why not? It's not a string, it's a variable. You got it working there? It might be a little bit different. Uh, it does. Uh, in, the, in the device it might look slightly different, which, which it always varies depending where you look at it. But uh, this is no quotes because I don't want to display a string. I don't want to string. I don't want it to literally say username. I wanted to show what's in the variable username. So no code set. Go ahead and save it and run it. Now what should happen is now what should happen is that it'll ask you for your name again. But this time it'll take your name, save it in a variable, and then display it in the console. Remember, we're outputting to the console. You're not going to see it on screen yet. You're going to display it in the console. So, so remember to open your console after you run it in the browser. Open the console right away. And then I'm going to go back to the info screen, customize, I'll type in a name, click OK, console output. So any new name that I put in, I click OK, it sees it, and it displays it in the console. All right, did that work for everyone? You got you got a name appearing in the console. Okay, so we're having this display in the console. What I want 
is for it to display on screen. I want it to um, be visible somewhere on the screen. The way I've got the app set up, it says welcome. Wouldn't it be nice if it says welcome, John? If we go over to the art, maybe mention get artsy, John. Maybe on computers, get techie, John. In short, I want to display the user's name in various parts of the app. I have a way now to ask for the username. I have a way to save it. Now I want to display it. And I want to display it in multiple places. We have the knowledge, most of the knowledge, to do that already. But we need it are two things. We need a placeholder. <coughs> Wherever we want to display that name, we need a placeholder or some way to delineate, put the name there. So we need a placeholder. And then we need the code to put that name on those different placeholders. So that means um, we'll go back to the HTML file, and we'll add some placeholders where we want the name to appear. So let's go back to Notepad. Let's go back to the index file. Over on line 43 is where we've got the welcome message. There are many ways to do this. Of course, many ways to do different things. Um, we will do it this way. On line 43, at the end of line 43, we will create a span. This is a generic container. It's related to the div. We've used and seen divs before. The big difference between div and span is that a div is a block level element and a span is an inline element, obviously. But what does that mean? What that means is divs will want to take up space and push the other stuff out of its space, basically. So if I've got both of these elements next to it, each other, and one is a div, this div is going to want to push this one off to its own line. That's a block level element. It uses the whole block for itself, basically. Whereas a span are inline elements. So if I mark this as a span, this one as a span, this one will play nice and they'll both stay on the same line. So that's a basic definition of a div and span. This will want its own space and span can coexist with other stuff. A span and a div are both generic placeholders. And in this placeholder, we're going to put in a name. The name that the person typed in. In order for the JavaScript to know, take that name and put it in line 43, we should name that element. Just like we named those buttons that we've worked with. They've had an ID or they've had a class. Something has an ID, I can reference it in JavaScript. Something has a class, I can reference it in JavaScript. Um, remind me again, what's the big difference between an ID and a class? Only the ID only once. Mm -hmm. And the span we can use, mul uh, and the class we can use multiple times. That's what we want here. We want to put the same name multiple times throughout our project. So an ID wouldn't work in this case. We would want a class. So inside of this span tag, we will add class equals welcome message might be a long name but we could do welcome msg welcome message we'll call this welcome message because maybe i'm thinking a little bit further ahead i could have called it you know welcome name or i can call a username class username whatever i can call these things whatever i want but maybe i want to reuse that span in different ways later on because it's a class so I've generically sort of called it welcome message. And what I want is this little chunk of code, this whole span plus the class, that's my placeholder where the person's name will exist eventually. I want to copy that. And now I can put that anywhere I want throughout my whole project, anywhere. And when someone asks for the name, I mean when someone adds their name, it will add their name there with a little more code, of course. But I want to use that in multiple places. Question. So let's say that they don't put their name in. Does it 
Is it is it um, degrade gracefully or does it show stuff? At the moment, if they don't put any name in, it, it's invisible. Spans are invisible. They're not going to show anything. And we can further write some CSS and such to you know make sure it's not visible. And we can write some other CSS and JavaScript you know for fail safes and such. So yeah, this won't do anything. It won't show any empty like broken link or anything like an like an empty image. It's just invisible. Copy that line of code, and we need to find elsewhere where it says, remember, get artsy. We're going to have it say, get artsy, John. So uh, we'll put the span right there. It'll say, get artsy, John, exclamation point. And I want to do the same thing over on the get techie um, line. So go find where it says get techie and paste that in there as well. Line 194. We'll we'll have it we'll have it put the name there, but we can put the user's name anywhere we want. Uh, now that we've got this little placeholder here. Save the HTML file and let's move over back to the JS file. So I suppose there's three big steps here. Step one, ask for the username. Step two, you need placeholders to display the username. And step three, put the name in the placeholder. So that's what comes next here. Whatever the person typed is saved in here, username. So somehow I need to display username on all instances of that placeholder. And I'm going to say it several times because it's totally true. There are many ways to do the same thing. So if you learn different things in different classes or learn on your own, it's valid. If it works, it works. I'm not saying this is the only way, the right way. Um, you'll find many ways to do many different things. Everyone's got their own, their own algorithm to make the perfect hello world. Um, code. There's no wrong answer. So what I want to do here next is I want to display the name on screen via jQuery because we've got jQuery we've got jQuery library. It helps us do more with less code. This will be slightly different but the syntax is still going to be very similar in that we have the, the jQuery selector. This lets us select things. This lets us target things in the project. What thing? Well, it's inside in quotes, and we've got dot welcome message. We have that span with a class, that span with a class um, in multiple places in our project. So don't forget the dot there, don't put, a, don't put a pound sign there. That means ID, and these are not IDs. So we're saying, wherever there is um, the welcome message, do something with it. And the something is this. We'll do dot HTML. This is different. We had dot on previously, and we got dot HTML. Basically, this is the jQuery shorthand to write some HTML in this element. Let's write something in that element. This can be any valid HTML. We'll get complex in a moment, but for the moment, just type username. Take the value in that variable, the person's name, and write that as HTML into wherever there's that span. Go ahead and save it and run it. Triple check that this dot welcome message is spelled exactly the same as your welcome message class in the HTML file. It is case sensitive. If you called it welcome message all lowercase, and here you wrote uppercase M, it will not work. And you might not get a good error message. Sometimes when you deal with classes and IDs, you don't get an error message. Uh, because it um, is technically not a syntax error, it's a logic error.
but the concept here should be then that it takes the name and after you close the window, after you close the, the prompt when the about window, close that, and you go back to the home screen, you should see the name there, and you should see it everywhere where you use the span. Victor. Welcome, Victor. Get artsy, Victor. Get techie, Victor. It worked. Did it work for you? Yes. But that's a very good point there. That it literally wrote what we told it to. We only took the person's name. Then there's no formatting and such which we'll add in just a moment. Um, but here we go. So did it, did it take your name? You can do it again. You can go back to that info screen and add another name. I've got it. The space before the welcome? Yeah, by default, it, uh, unless you added it manually, it wouldn't have added the space. I could do it like this, that I uh, add a space here. I did it in my code. And then you click OK, and then you'll see a space there, but no one's going to think to add a space in front, so we will have to add it in code because it does exactly what we tell it, what we told it. We said, take this, whatever's in the variable, show it on screen. We didn't say anything about spaces or any other formatting, and uh, that's what we have to fix. So at the moment, if you follow the code exactly as I wrote it, then you get a result, but not the best result. And this is what I have said before about um, there's a lot of details, troubleshooting, that's why there's beta testing, that's why there's alpha testing. You know, testing stuff in-house, then sending it to more people to test, and then larger tests and such. Um, that's why there's still software bugs, because there's so much to deal with, so many lines of code. Logically, this should have worked, and it technically did, but not exactly for, like, people. It worked for the computer, but it didn't work for people, because I'm missing a space there, and that little bit is shows, you know, if I'm not a programmer and I look at that and I say, who got fired for this mistake? Well, it's such obviously a little mistake, but those little mistakes could also be huge mistakes down the line when you don't do this right for like your big algorithm to save in the database. That's why there's bugs, that's why there's problems. I'm not excusing bad software, but you now are going to be seeing it. You're going to be seeing the from behind the scenes perhaps about why sometimes software is not perfect. I'm going to go back and add that space, then we'll take a break, and then we'll make this even better, because uh, we have a big flaw. So the space means, go back to your JavaScript, and we're saying here, to the span named welcome message, add this HTML, username, only username. I need a space before the username, so what I'll do here is I'll write, quote, space, quote, space, plus, space. These quotes here are to display a literal string, display a space, and then the username. So that plus is concatenation, display this, and then display that. It's not adding one and two, it's say display this, and then this, space. Question? Either, either or. Um, there could be re times where you can't do it in the HTML. Because um, I can add that space in the HTML, sure. But sometimes you can't. Sometimes you, it's very dynamic content that you can't 
account for it early on. So I'm just showing here, this is one way to also add the space dynamically at that moment. So that simple little change there should not give you an extra space without you having to worry about uh, without having to worry about the person themselves typing it. I'll show one more thing, then we'll take a break because this works, but there's various flaws here. Some easier than others to, to fix. Let me load mine up and I'll explain here. So this is a brand new thing. We're going to use this several times also. This is very cool. .html. This is jQuery. This can be accomplished also via plain old, um, plain old JavaScript, but it would be more typing. Um, just off the top of my head, it would be you know. Uh, blah 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 dot uh, inner HTML equals quotes and then the stuff in there so that's the old way and then the new way is dot HTML and then well, not old way new way but one is uh, one is plain old JavaScript and one is modern jQuery a couple characters here and there but uh, more functionality Anyway, let me see here. So I should see, asks for the name, close that, there we go, welcome Bill. Maybe I should put a comma, right? That would be a little more grammatically correct. Welcome, comma, Bill. So um, let's take a break. It's 7.22, we'll be back at 7.32. And then we will we will work more here because the the flaw that we will see is um, <coughs> this is not permanent. If I close if I close my uh, my whole browser and run the app again, it's not going to remember the name anymore. It's going to be completely empty again. It's going <coughs> to delete my variables and start all over. And that's not good for a real app. I want it to remember me. So we're back at seven thirty two. <coughs> Just one moment, I saw a couple hands before you. Thank 
Okay, so I'm, I'm with you.
No, because uh, I can't find it now. It's in one away. This is what it tells me. It says, uh, S, it gives me this here. I went this far, I downloaded it and all that stuff. Where you go to request for Android. It says, the special team is called Destination Dependency. Child to receive kid. It's empty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
All right, everyone, let's move on. Let's get back to our project here.